All right, welcome back. And now we're going to move on to the protists. So we're moving on to the eukaryotes. So we talked about the bacteria and the key characteristics of them. So now we're going to move over to domain eukaryota. And we're going to talk about the protist group, the kingdom protista, first off. So first off, I want to just remind yourself about the eukaryotic cell. Remember, these are more complex. So the prokaryotes, you kind of thought of them as the efficiency apartment. It had the basic components that you needed to survive, but, you know, it just had the basics. But once you get a little bit more advanced, you get that promotion into job, you want to move on up. So then you move up to the eukaryotic cell. Now remember these cells are a little bit more complex. They're going to have that true nuclei, which is going to be, which is your nucleus surrounded by the nuclear membrane. And you're also going to have membrane-bound organelles. So think of these as tiny little organs that all had specific jobs. So if you read all these, maybe some good memories or bad memories coming back. But remember, all these little organelles had specific things. And what it did was allow the cells to get more complex. And when you got more complex, you can be a more complex organism also. Well, they're also more compounds, so you're going to see when we talk, start talking about these eukaryotes, we are allowed to become organisms composed of more than one cell. And then they're also larger. Bacteria are so small. That's why they're very boring to study in lab because you have to have a high power microscope in. They're just boring and they're small. And But when we get to the eukaryotic cells, we get to be more complex. When we get to be larger, we get to have more bells and whistles, and we're just larger in size, too. Now, just recall when we talked about the basic eukaryotic cells in 1408, there is the animal cell and the plant cell. Um, we're going to add the protists and the fungi, but there's a lot of basic similarities. You're not going to be able to see all these organelles um, within the cells. Remember, when I talked about it, you have the stain for different organelles. But I you appreciate there's a lot of similarities between the different types of eukaryotic cells. Now, one key thing about eukaryotic cells is they do have those organelles, are those little tiny organs. And I did talk about this in 1408. I called it the endosymbiotic theory. I called it tasty snacks. So the eukaryotic cells, we have to have a find a way to make energy. So you can either go through that via the process of photosynthesis or cellular respiration. So if you remember the organelles that do that are the mitochondria, and the chloroplast, all right? So this is all coming back to haunt you from before. Don't worry, you're not gonna have to go through the whole cycle again, but how did we get these organelles? Well, eventually we had this prokaryotic cell. And then what's happened first is we started to get these foldings, start to fold in on itself. And we started these membrane infoldings happen, and eventually what happened is we folded in and surrounded our nucleus, and we made a nuclear membrane around the nucleus. So we had that membrane-bound nucleus. Now this little eukaryotic cell, he's hungry. He's got to eat. Then the way they got through and got food sources was by engulfing other organisms. So he went through and he saw this little bacterium right here and he just kind of sucked them up and engulfed him. Now instead of breaking him down for food, he discovered, hey, he's really good at making energy and he does it very efficiently and I can't do that. So instead of destroying him down for smaller parts, he kept him around and gave him a job as an organelle, and that's how we got our mitochondria. Now, same thing happened, similar, a different organelle, a little pro you, her eukaryote, engulfed the cyanobacterium, which goes through the process of photosynthesis, and it's like, you can make energy from sunlight, that is awesome. So instead of breaking it down for foodstuffs, keep it around, there we have our chloroplast. So evidence that we have that the mitochondria and chloroplast were once individual organisms because they each have their own DNA. And they also have ribosomes that are smaller and similar to more to but that too similar to bacterial ribosomes. So that is why we have the support for this theory. Just want to remind yourselves about it. I think it's cool. So when it comes to protists, what you should get from this lecture is they're very diverse. There's a lot out there um, when it comes to the different species and function. You can spend probably a whole semester on all the diversity that is just the fung uh, or just the protist. Now, pretty much um, the reason you see diversity is any eukaryote that is not a plant, an animal, or a fungus. 
you're going to see some of them are going to go through the process of photosynthesis. Some are actually going to consume bacteria. Um, a large of them are going to have that symbiotic relationship with something, and some of them are going to be severe pathogens. And they live in uh, so many different ecosystems. They're all over the place, and they have key roles in the biosphere. Now, most of them are going to be the small little unicellular guys that you see right here, but we do have some exceptions. So think of brown algae like help. Oh, you didn't think that. We well, thought that was probably a plant, but it's actually a protist. Um, slime molds on this category, too. So I thought that's kind of cool. This is probably your what moment? You thought that was a plant? But no, it's actually a protist. Really cool, huh? So how do these guys move around? So here's just an image of all kinds of different protists. So you can see what I was talking about, the diversity. Now, they can range in very small size to so about three feet. Very, very much the first lot of diversity. And they're going to have different methods for moving around. Now, some of them are going to use this flagella. Um, if you remember in the last lecture, I posted that video uh, showing them how they can move around. Some are going to use ciliates or cilia a lot. It's a little hairs, which is kind of hard to see. Like that's a good example right here and this one right here. Um, you're going to see the amoeba, um, especially when I, I'll have a video of him moving around. Um, it's actually in this video, too, where they use like what's called a false foot or a pseudo pod to move around. And they're constantly changing their shape, which looks like this guy right here. And then there's going to be some that are non-modal. They're just going to rely on the environment to move them around. Now, if you click on here, it's not long. It's just, just a video showing all kinds of different protists. I think they took a drop of pond water. And you can see all kinds of stuff moving around. You can see multiple examples that fall into this category of different ranges of movement. So how do these guys eat? As I not told you, they're diverse. And they have different methods for getting food. Now, some of We'll go through the process of photosynthesis by using light to convert carbon to sugar for energy. Yay for them. Other ones, they have to engulf other bacteria through the process of phagocytosis. So what they're going to do is engulf a food particle and put it into a food vacuole. Then that is going to merge with the lysosome, which has a digestive enzyme, and it'll break it down into smaller parts, but the cell will take what it needs, and then it will get rid of the waste products that it doesn't need. Now, some of them are going to do both photosynthesis and phagocytosis, and it just depends on what the environment is um, and what resources you have at that time. So everyone has to go through reproduction, and these guys are primarily going to go through ase asexual reproduction. Now, they're most often going to opt for a binary fission where they're just going to split into two, so they'll copy everything and go into two cells. Now, some of them will go through the process of multiple fission, where they're going to split into multiple cells. And then a few will go through the process of budding, which is where one cell separates from a larger cell. So here we have a larger cell, and here we have a smaller one about to break off and bud off. Now, some do resort to sexual reproduction in extreme conditions. It just happens to be like, hey, we're in an extreme environment, and alone, if I make a copy of myself, it's less likely to survive. But if we combine our genes together, I might give our offspring a better chance. So there's a, like I said, this group is so diverse, and there's a lot going on with it. But, you know, this is like some of the basic understanding that we have so far about them. So lots of words. So how do we classify all this? Um, we are getting more and more ways to organize it, um, especially with our advances in DNA sequencing and how can we go through and group them. Um, I'm going to kind of hit on each of these different groups, and you can see these names are going to um, I'm just going to botch these like, like no other. I only get to teach 1409 or the second half, half of biology once a year. So I don't get to practice all these long names all the time. So I'm sorry if I screwed them up. But we're going to break them up into six super groups, and I'm going to kind of hit on each of them and kind of show you some examples from each of them. Now, you're going to see some similarities, but then some of them are going to seem really diverse. Um, classification of protists is rather difficult. Um, I'm pretty sure there's lots of different arguments. Like it should be organized differently, but this is what we have right now, and this is what we're going to use. So the first one is the RK plastida. Hopefully I got that right. So these have 
um, the descendants of an endosymbiotic relationship between a heterotrophic protist and a cyanobacterium. So this is where we're going to get those first chloroplasts. So you can see those nice pretty green things right there. Now what's really interesting is the first land plants evolved from an ancestor of these protists. So plants are closer related to protists than anything else. So these are the very early plant ancestors. Now you're going to have the red algae and the green algae fall into this group. So some of them will be unicellular, you'll see multicellular and then colonial forms. Colonial forms, not colonial. Wrong word right there. So here's some examples, the red-eyed algae and the green algae. So the red algae, you mostly find them in clear tropical oceans, and they're going to be very um, multicellular. Your seaweeds are going to fall into this group right here. Now, they can have a different range of pigments, and what's really great about these guys right here is we use them a lot in sciences. They have this gelatinous substance, a commercial value called agar. Um, we use it a lot to run a lot of our gels for molecular biology um, to solidify things. So agar is a big resource in biology, and it's probably used a lot in um, other areas too. Now green algae is that slime that you're mostly going to find in ponds and lakes. It is going to be very photosynthetic, but it's just kind of that sludge that you're used to seeing. Now amoebas, amoebazoa, these are going to be unicellular, but they're going to be marge multinucleated cells and multi they have multicellular phases too. Now they use this false foot for movement and they're always kind of shape, changing shapes. They don't have one exact shape. They're always kind of like moving. So this is a great video of an amoeba moving. You can see it's always constantly changing shape. It's really kind of fun to watch, kind of relaxing almost. Now these are free living and some of them are going to be parasitic. And you're going to find them primarily in aquatic and terrestrial environments. And if it is terrestrial, it's going to be mostly in the very moist areas. As it says right here, slime molds fall into this group. And they are key decomposers for the forest floor. All right. Opistocota, conta. All right. That's a mouthful right there. So these are the single posterior flagellum, and they're going to use it for movement. This is um, one of the best images I could find to show you right there. So here's about five of them together. I don't know if they're marching on this food source right here. But they have that long collar right here. It's going to be very similar to what you know, the sponges happen. And they resemble the, like I said, they are the common ancestor of sponges and pretty much all animals right here. You're going to see this collar cell appearance happen to show up in the fall and when we talk about the sponges. And um, they're going to go through and use that as kind of like a filter to bring things into their body. The rhizaria. So we're going to have some amoebas fall in here, but the key thing about them is they have all these thin threads. So it kind of looks like all these thin threads like things coming off them. Um, they're kind of lemon-like, root-like, um, and they come off the organism. Now these are going to be key for both the nitrogen and carbon cycles and forums are also going to be in this group. They look like little bitty snails. Um, one thing that scientists do is they do follow these guys and they are great indicators for pollution. So there's different an organisms, animals, and plants that we kind of use as indicators to watch when things are going bad. Um, the mosses are key for plants um, because they are great indicators of pollution. Um, amphibians for animals, if you start to see the amphibians die out, that means the water source is probably polluted, there's a problem. And then these guys are also another great indicator. So the chromoalveolta, like I said, these are mouthfuls. Very, very diverse group right here. You can see just by looking at these guys right here, you see a lot of diversity just by looking at them. The alveolates, um, these are going to be primarily your parasites. Um, they're going to do things that cause red tides, and your ciliates are going to fall right here. Kind of looks like a little, like a scary monster. If I came across that, I'd be kind of scared of it too. Um, they're going to be very single-celled, and they're going to have these like, very small cavities beneath their surface of their cells, of the exterior of their surface. The ampiocomplexins, or the sporozoans, they're going to be your parasites. Um, plasmodium, the causer of malaria, falls into this guy right here. Boom, boom, boom. They do not have a mode of locomotion. They reside inside a host cell. 
Now the straminophiles, um, these are so diverse. Um, they're going to be photosynthetic and there's also going to be some that don't go through photosynthesis. And they're going to have a lot of diversity in the shape. So this is an example of a population of diatoms. And if you look at it, you can see all kinds of different types. These are actually all protists. These are all living organisms. Just look at the diversity that you see right there. Um, really cool. Um, some are single cell, some are multicellular, and a lot of diversity. And the excavata, and a lot of protists are going to fall in this group. So they're going to be very asymmetrical. Um, I don't think any of them have been very symmetrical so far, but they're going to have this feeding groove, which you can kind of see right here, that's going to be on one side. So it's kind of excavated from one side. Now, you are going to have a lot of predators, and but there are some photosynthetic species and some parasites. Um, but some of them are going to lack mitochondria, so they're going to highly rely on photosynthesis. Now, one you might have heard on is euglena, and I think if you watch one of the earlier videos, you actually see plenty of examples. Um, they're mostly in the fresh water, and they have the flagella. Now, this is where we start to see the primitive eye spot that sparked the form in some of these animal species um, later on. So this is like a photoreceptor. Um, they call it the eye spot. So it has a lot of synthesis and move towards it for photosynthesis. Sorry, my pointer's all over the place. Now I always try to find something cool. And if you ever um, get to see this in your lifetime, it's on my bucket list, um, the bioluminescent waves. So these waves are, they have that, that glow right there. And these are actually called by protists, called the dinoflagellates. And there's, the, this should be a mic, nano, micrometer, sorry, that's a little typo right there. And you'll find this in various places around the world. Um, there was an island by Puerto Rico that I wanted to go to when I was in there for a conference, but I wasn't able to make it there. But when they're by themselves, they don't make a lot of light. But if you get a large population of them, they go this process of bioillumination. So this is really cool. It occurs in different areas. I would say watch this video, and it talks about that, and it shows you some examples. It's a, I think it's an older video. But it goes through and talks about this whole process and how they go through and do it. Really cool. So that's all on protists. Um, here's some more videos about them if you'd like. And then finally, credit to all my images.